Good morning. My name is Jeff Coleman, and I'm the senior pastor here at Church on the Hill. Welcome. We are glad that you are with us. Real quick, before we dive into our sermon, I got a little, a couple, few housekeeping items, if I may. Uh, how many people have a great sense of smell? Do you smell that in the air? Smell that burning thing? The building is not on fire, just to let you know. Uh, we, we've turned off the unit, uh, a couple of the units on the top of the building. We think there's a, uh, maybe a belt or it's a bearing. That's what we think you're smelling. So, but we are praying, Lord, in the name of Jesus, please don't burn your house to the ground. We are praying for a fire from heaven in the name of Christ, but just not that kind, right? Secondarily, number, uh, number two, uh, this afternoon at three o'clock in the chapel, which is on the lower end of the campus, we're going to have a town hall meeting. Uh, we're, again, here's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear the recommendation from the church council that our congregation join the GMC after having disaffiliated from the UMC. We're going to be present. We're going to answer questions. So today, 3 p.m., so when we're done here, go, go eat, change clothes, get comfortable, do whatever, and hopefully you're going to be back here at 3 o'clock again in the chapel. We're going to meet down there, and we'll be answering questions about that proposal. Does that sound good? Say yes. Uh, third, and, and really probably uh, one that's really important, and that is it's almost Christmas Eve. We've got a few weeks. Gentlemen, get your shopping going. But we're, what we want you to do is we want you to invite somebody to Christmas Eve. So do this. Grab your phone real quick. Grab your phone real quick. It's not going to hurt. Grab your phone. Open up that QR code. I got to do is put your camera up there and just scan it. Open it up, and here's what you can do. You can download an invite, and then you can send it to a friend. Because what we want you to do is we want you to invite somebody, just one person. You don't have to invite, you know, like your whole neighborhood. That'd be amazing. Um, But just just one, because there's one person that you have the ability to reach that we can't. And so if you'll just download uh, that simple invite, send it to them at some point, say, hey, make plans to attend, you know, 10, 3, and 5, I'm going to the 5. You know, would you join me or whatever? Come sit next to me or whatever. We would love for you to do that, okay? That sounds good. Yes, nod your head. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Tell you what let's do. Let's go to God in prayer, and then we're going to dive straight in to our sermon this morning. Our Lord and our God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you, God, that you call us into a place where we can worship you, where we can worship you as the Scripture declares that you are the Prince of Peace. Jesus, angels announce that you are the one who brings peace, that you bring peace on earth. Jesus, when you were resurrected, you walked into an upper room and you looked at your disciples and you said, peace be with you. Jesus, there's somebody in the room who needs peace. Speak to us this morning. Let your word come forth. We'll give you all the thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You ever bought your kids a a, a Christmas present and then they wound up playing with the box instead of playing with the present? right? Remember those days? Yeah, it still happens, right? And, and that's because there's, there's something innate about our own imagination that we want, and we get the toy, we get the thing, we get the new phone, we get all that kind of stuff, and it's good, but eventually, you know what happens? The new phone just becomes a phone. It becomes an old phone, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And because it's just a thing. The brand new car, as, as excited as you are, and it's incredible, and it can have a red bow on it and the whole nine yards, eventually, you're going to have to have the tires replaced. You're going to get new brakes. You're going to have to have an old, you know, change. You're going to have to do the thing, and it's just a car. And, and, and all, it, this is the way it is with anything. It's the new suit, or it's the coat, or it's the shoes. It's the thing. It's whatever, it's whatever your play pretty or toy or thing is for you. Eventually, the new will wear off. Now, here's the thing. The society in the world out there tells us that we need the new thing. That they tell us that we've got to go and we've got to buy the thing. We need to go spend money in this kind of thing. I read an article not long ago that said, Savers Slowing Economy. Now, when I was in college, I took a a macroeconomics class. I made a D, moment of confession. Probably needed to go to class, I later found out, was a good thing. What I, what, even though I made a D, here's what I do know. I know that consumer spending accounts for about 70% of our economy. So economists want us to go out and spend, spend money. And this is what the holiday season seems to be about. And it's, it's all of this kind of stuff. And so it's all of this kind of spending and this is it. And you know, this is it. Joy to the wallet and you know, all the kind of things when you go and you can buy a new car and, and do this thing and give the gift that everyone wants and you know, all that kind of stuff. But, but at the same time, what I want to say today as we jump into the 
second uh, message in this simple Christmas idea, because last week, by way of review, we talked about worship fully. We said every time we come to church, we're longing for an experience with God. We want to experience God. But what God wants us to do is to do the right thing at the right time and for the right reason. And when we do, because we're in a relationship with Almighty God, then we're better positioned to experience the presence and power and person of God. This morning, here's what we're talking about. So that was worship fully. Today, what we're going to talk about is a simple idea. It's called this. Ready? Here it is. Spend less. Right now, there's somebody who's going, you do realize that Cyber Monday was like last Monday. I know, and, and that's okay. And notice, I, I didn't say don't spend. I didn't say don't buy gifts and don't give gifts. And No, no, no. I didn't say any of that. We're just going to talk a, a little bit about some ideas about how we can reorient some heart priorities in the midst of this holiday season as we lead into Christmas. And it can still be a season, Advent, of preparation where we're preparing our own hearts for the coming of the Christ child so that we can experience peace. Here's what I think we really need. I think we need to remember the words of Jesus found in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by what? How much you own. That's a good word at the holiday season. And so what I think we need is a retelling of the original Christmas story because the Christmas story, it has been packaged and bought and sold and marketed and commercialized and all that kind of stuff for hundreds of years. And the reality is the story still stays the same. You don't have to get cute. You don't have to get creative necessarily with it. All you got to do as a church is just announce the fact that the story is the story and we're drawn into it and a part of it, right? Because you think about Jesus. You think when Jesus came to us, he came to us through Joseph and Mary, yeah, and they were a very poor couple. They weren't like us, more than likely. They were a very poor couple. They didn't have what we have, but yet at the same time, they had everything. So here's what this points to. This points to a simple reality. Here it is. Christmas has never been about stuff. Instead, it's been about what? A savior. And that's not a what, that's a who. And it's Jesus. This is it. Now again, like I said, not opposed to gift giving, not opposed to spending money, not opposed to any of those kind of things. I'm just simply saying that if we really want peace, what I think is missing in the heart and soul of most people is just that. It's this idea of peace, but that comes from contentment. And I think contentment, I think they actually kind of work in tension with one another. And so I think if we're contented, we have peace. And if we're at peace, then we'll have contentment. And they kind of go back and forth because what really is going on is most of us, if we were to peel the onion and we were to be deadly honest, we would realize that actually we're discontented with the way life has presented itself to us. And so because we have, because we have this sense of dis contentment or dissatisfaction with the way the world is or the way our life is oriented or, or whatever it, it, it is, what we begin to do is we begin to medicate and we start turning to other things and stuff and, 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 and addictions and this and this little small thing and that thing and this thing and that thing and even, even down to the way in which we spend money. Because what are, we, what are we doing ultimately? Ultimately, we're anesthetizing our own sense of pain and dissatisfaction and discontentment with the way life is. And what this leads us to is something that, that really, and, and th this is the idea, this is what really separates us from God. Are you ready? And it's not warm and fuzzy and nobody wants to talk about it. It's the word sin. And somebody goes, oh, sin's so passe and that's, you know, that's your granny's church. And I want to say, no, that's just church. Because it's true. That's what Jesus came to do, right? Like Jesus came to give his life, not so that he could like, you know, just motivate us to be a better you by Friday. No. No. Jesus came to give his life on a cross to reconcile you back into the presence of Almighty God so that you could be in a right relationship with the Father. So that then one day when he would ascend to heaven, he would pour out the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would live in you. You would be the living embodiment of Christ continuing his ministry here on earth, right? This is the church. This is what we're supposed to be about. So I'm not talking about sin in terms of all the lowercase s sins, like, you know, the, all the little piddly little behaviors that we all kind of, you know, wrangle with and stuff. And it's like, oh, he's talking about smoking and drinking and cussing. And, you know, not necessarily. I mean, some of that stuff's not good for you, and you know that. And I'm not going to point out any of that kind of stuff. I'm not going to do that. What I'm talking about is capital S, sin, not lowercase s, sins, plural. I'm talking about singular capital S, sin, which is nothing more than a system that has been in effect since probably the creation of the world. And it's what set the world off course. 
in Genesis chapter 3, right? Like you've heard me say, before God created the world in two chapters, we broke it in one. He spends the rest of the book putting everything back together again. And that's it. That's the story of God. That's the story of God. So what I'm really talking about is a system and a power, and if you're not careful, it is in the world, and if you're not careful, you will serve it like a God, lowercase g. That's sin. And the world is broken. And that's the sense of dissatisfaction and dis-ease, if you will, and discontent that I think we feel. And so John the Baptist, who comes to prepare the way for Messiah, right? He shows up on the scene in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. In those days, John the Baptist came into the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, read it with me, repent of your sins and turn to, for the kingdom of heaven is Exactly. This is it. And here's the key word for John's ministry. John's ministry, which is also the key word for Jesus' ministry, they start their ministries in the same exact way. And the key word is repent. This is where he starts. He says, repent, repent. Here's what it means. It means to change the mind. Literally, the word for repent means to change the mind. It means you change your mind in terms of the direction that your life is going in, and then you act on the change. You go 180 degrees in the opposite direction. You head back to God. That's what it means to repent. That's it. This is what John comes saying. John says, hey, here's what you need to do. I need you to repent. I need you to change the mind in terms of the way that you are living your life, and then you need to move toward God. And when you do that, you're going to be living your life in better alignment with who God has called you to be. The Greek word, just so that you know, the Greek word for sin is the word hamartia. And hamartia is actually... Uh, it. It's an archery term, and it means to miss the mark. And the idea is when an archer pulls back and he lets go of the arrow, any time the arrow misses the mark, biblically speaking, that would be sin. Our lives are lived in such a way that when we miss the mark of living in right relationship with Almighty God, that is sin. Here's what John, the prophets, uh, Jesus, and Paul are all saying every time that they're talking about this idea of sin, capital S sin, not lowercase little sins. Here's what they're saying. Here's what they're saying. They're saying, examine your life and everything that has the ability to pull you off the mark so that you are then living your life in such a way that is off the mark of who God has called you to be and who God wants you to be in the world. And then do this, change the mind, repent, Turn away from that, go 180 degrees in the opposite direction and follow hard after God. That's the message. Jeff, time out. What in the world does this have to do with spending less at Christmas? Just this. If you are not careful, what will happen in your life, and if you are not content with what you have, if you don't have a settled sense of peace in your soul, what will happen is you will begin to search for everything to find significance, to find the hope, to find the contentment, to find the peace, and you'll go everywhere for it. It doesn't matter what it is. You'll turn to everything. doesn't matter. Sex, drugs, money, this, power, gambling, that thing, this thing. That, you name it. You just name it. And, that, and then what happens is that leads you into all those lowercase s sins, right? And so I'm not saying don't spend money because it was Cyber Monday, okay? And you probably got some deals. I mean, I know, I know we did. Is that's okay. So I'm not saying don't spend money, and I'm not saying don't buy gifts. Yeah, go buy gifts. Go, go do that thing. What I am saying is maybe we just need to examine how we're spending God's resources. Maybe what we need to do is we need to realign our priorities around that. And I will ask this question. Is it possible that retail therapy might actually separate us from God rather than draw us close to God? Right? You say, oh, but it feels so good. Yeah, it does. I, I get it. Sure it does. Yeah, and it's fun. Yes, absolutely. But eventually, like most things in life that are the small lowercase s sins, they leave us wanting later. Because after the euphoric dopamine kind of effect has worn off, then we're kind of like, oh, man. You ever had buyer's remorse? Right? Like you bought the thing, and then it showed up, and you're like, oh, she's going to kill me. You know? Or you're like, oh, he's, he's not going to appreciate the fact that I spent this much money, right? 
Isaiah the prophet wonders, God does really through Isaiah, kind of wonders why we're spending some things and doing stuff on things that don't really satisfy. In Isaiah 55, uh, the prophet says, why spend your money on food that doesn't give you strength? Why pay for food that does no good? Listen to me, he says. You will eat what is good and you will enjoy the finest food. You want the holiday to be different? Contentment is critical. You got to have peace. Because here's the thing, you want it. You know you do, and you need it. Paul the Apostle would write to Timothy, his young protege in the ministry, and he would say this toward the end of his first letter, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, a godly life brings huge profits to people who are content with what they what? Have. That's it. So it's not all this wanting. It's not all this grasping. It's not this thing. It's, it's not all that. Custom. Listen, wants are fine, and we're not saying you know, don't want things. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying get it, get it reordered. Right? Like, here's the thing. Our lives, listen to me, our life should be, our life should be content with our God given circumstances, but not satisfied with our spiritual growth. But so oftentimes in life, we get that flipped that we become very content with and sat, and we, get, we become content and satisfied with our spiritual life, and we want better for our life circumstances. No, no. No, we should be satisfied with where we are and content with where we are in our life. doesn't mean we don't have wants. See, the good thing is God, because God loves us, sometimes God gives us our wants, right? And sometimes God even gives us, God's always going to give us our needs. And then sometimes God gives us our, our, our wants as well. But there are also going to be instances in life when we should, we should be satisfied with our life circumstances, but we should never, never, ever, ever be satisfied with our spiritual growth. Do you know why? Because there's more. There's always more in Jesus Christ. You haven't plumbed the depths of the word of the living God. You don't, you, you don't know all that the Holy Spirit has for you. There's more. There's more for every one of you in terms of your own spiritual growth and your life in Christ. I'll never forget those words that uh, Asbury Theological Seminary president, when I was there, he said this, and I've said it before, you are as holy as you want to be. I don't remember anything else he said after that message right there. I just don't. That was the, he, the, it, was some, it was a quote somewhere. He uttered it inside his, of his sermon. I have no clue what else he was talking about. I just remember going, boom, you're as holy as you want to be. Wow. In other words, there's more for us, gang. But what do you got to do? You got to learn the secret of contentment. This is what Paul says. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, I have learned the secret to being content in any and every circumstance, whether full or hungry or whether having plenty or being poor. Contentment does not come from what we do. Contentment comes from what we go through. You think about the life of the apostle Paul. Think about him. He was beat. He was shipwrecked. He was whipped. He was stoned. He was arrested. He was chased. He was maligned. He was hated. I mean, think of everything this dude went through. You haven't even touched a fraction of that. And Paul writes at some point to the Philippians and goes, hey, by the way, I've learned the secret to being content, whether I got a lot or a little. And I want to scoot up on the edge of my seat and I want to go, give it up, bro, what do you got? And basically, here's what he says. In effect, he says, real contentment and real peace, it's found in, comes from God, period, end of sentence. That's it. That's it. That's where it comes from. That's this deep satisfaction. Listen to me. That is the deep satisfaction that you hunger for and you want and only God can, can provide. Only God is going to give that. And what I would also tell you is this. The secret to contentment is a life lived in a right relationship with Jesus Christ and that is a repented life. That is a life that says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go 180 degrees in the opposite direction. I'm going to change my mind in terms of the direction that I'm going in and I'm going to live my life in alignment with who God has called me to be. That's it. See, see, the point of the gospel, this is, this is fascinating. The point of the gospel is not to tell you how rotten and horrible you are, because you're not. The point of the gospel is for God to tell you how much he loves you and how forgiven you are when you accept his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. Somebody say amen. amen. That's you. And so consequently, you get to be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. There should be nothing more peaceful and contented and calming than that right there. So here's what I want to do in the time that I've got left, which is really short. 
I'm going to walk through four simple ideas about what I think you can do to spend less in the holiday season. Ready? Number one, reinvest. Take the money you give on one gift and donate it to your favorite charity. Or if you want our suggestion, we would say give it to the Block Community Outreach because we're partial. And they could use the help. Number two, pause and consider. How many people are still fighting the traffic at the mall? Anybody? Good, you're smart. Thank you. Yeah, don't do that in the name of Jesus, right? Like, just stay away from the mall. And so if you're not going out and you're not fighting the traffic, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff, you're not having to traipse through stores in the mall and whatever, then do this. Stay home one evening, turn the TV off, and read the Christmas story. And here, Christmas story is found in the first two chapters of Matthew and the first two chapters of Luke. Real simple. Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2. Stay home, read the story, pause and consider that Almighty God came to earth for you, period. Wow. Third idea, invite Jesus, expect a miracle. There's somebody in the room, you need God to show up in your life. You do. You need it in a financial thing, you need it in a relationship thing, it's a parenting struggle, it's a work deal, it's this thing, it's that thing, it's whatever. I don't know. You do. You know where it is. So here's what I want to say. I want to say, why don't you do this? Why don't you go back to the drawing board and you exercise your faith and you invite God into that place and you expect a miracle in the name of Jesus. And then you just stand back, give it to God and watch God move. You go, What's God? what if God doesn't move? Ask that exercise faith, don't have doubt. But what if God doesn't move? Leave it to God. It's God's problem. It's not yours. Just, just do this. Invite Jesus. Expect miracles. Here's what I believe. and I don't, You don't have to believe it. Here's what I believe. I believe that the Christmas season is a season of miracles. Here's why. The Creator put on human skin and was born as a baby and lived among us. That is a miracle. So, invite Jesus. Expect a miracle. Remember what the angel Gabriel told Mary? For nothing, read this with me, for nothing will be impossible. Last idea, real simple, buy one less gift. I didn't say don't buy gifts. I didn't say that. Just buy one less. Nobody, he doesn't, dad doesn't need the tie, trust me. He doesn't want the tie, okay? Don't buy the sweater. Don't buy the thing. Use the money. And, and redirect it into, again, kind of goes back to number one, reinvest that. Just buy one less gift, reinvest it, and give it to somebody who's in need, you know? Because when you give, it breaks the power, literally, it breaks the power of greed. C.S. Lewis once said this, and he didn't have a rigid formula for giving, but here's what he said. He said, I do not believe that we can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditures exclude them. Wow. So maybe what that means is we all go back to the drawing board and we ask God, Lord, how would you have us bless so-and-so? Or how would you have me bless someone? Or maybe, maybe it's what Alan talked about earlier, and that's maybe it's you partnering with us in terms of the Christmas offering. I don't know. I don't know. But these are just some simple handholds, if you handlebars, if you will, that I think if we're willing to, to spend less and how we exercise our faith and how we step into this place where we can begin to practice this idea of a simple Christmas. I knew a pastor, he preached a sermon series once and then wrote a book called um, It's Not Your Birthday. <laughs> but, but we act like Christmas is our birthday, you know? And we do because we, you know, people say, oh, what do you want for your birthday? What do you want for, your, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want? And it's like, hey, by the way, Christmas is not your birthday. And so the idea is this, because we're always after and we're grabbing and we're grasping and we're doing the thing and we're this kind of thing. And here's what he says. We're constantly searching for the one thing that will satisfy us. Yet each time we trust the promises of our possessions, more barriers are raised between our true selves and God's plain command to love him above all things. Then he says this. It's not necessarily that we want more. It's that what we want is something we cannot buy. And it's peace. <laughs> it's contentment. And you can't buy it, sir. You can't buy that, ma'am. But thanks be to God in Jesus Christ. He can provide it. And he can give it. What did we say? Here's what we said. We said Christmas has never been about stuff. Instead... It's about a Savior. So let's do this. Let's keep it about the Savior. And we'll make it way less about all the stuff. Amen? Okay.
So here's how we're gonna here's how we're gonna wrap up our, our morning together. Ready? <clears throat> the band's gonna come. Communion servers, come on down. Uh, take the elements and take your spot. I'm gonna invite you to come to the table. I'm going to invite you into this place where we remember that Jesus gave himself for us. You're going to get a piece of bread. It's there on the tray or prepackaged elements, whatever you need. And that represents the body of Christ. You're going to take that bread. You're going to then dip it into the cup, symbolizing the blood of Christ, and you're going to receive. And then here's what we're going to do. Ready? You're dismissed. So we're coming to the table having already pronounced the benediction. So there's no formal benediction. There's no open your hands. We're just, I'm just going to say you're dismissed. After you've come to Holy Communion, if you want to, you may leave. Maybe you've got places to go. You've got stuff you've got to do, whatever. That's fine. So just feel the freedom because that's what you've got this morning. You've got the freedom to leave the room. But what I would also say is this. There's probably somebody in the room. You don't have to rush away. And you don't need to. Because you actually need a space when we've closed the table to maybe come and, and kneel here and pray. Or maybe it's the person who doesn't know Jesus Christ who's your friend or your neighbor or whatever it is. Or maybe there's a sickness on somebody's life and you maybe you should want to light a candle for them and you want to pray for them and you want to remember them. And you can do that over there and that'd be great. Or over here. Or maybe there's a prayer partner in the back of the room that you need to go and pray with because again you heard me say this before there's something really powerful about hearing somebody else utter your name before a holy God and and then then the last thing and then I'm going to pray and we're done stand to your feet and this is the most important there is somebody in the room today you don't know Christ you go to church. And that's good. But you don't know who Jesus is. That's why you feel discontented and so torn up inside. And I want to say that, that the Scripture says today is the day of salvation. And I don't want you, sir or ma'am, to leave this place without having the opportunity to allow Jesus to be who He's always been. And that is Lord and Savior, principally over your life. So here's what I want you to do, if that's you, because I don't know your story. I want you to come see me, because I'm going to pray with you. We're going to do some business with God, and we're going to take a step across the line of faith. And you, on this day, are going to find life eternal and the peace that you have so longed for let's pray Jesus this is a holy space and I sense in this moment you're up to something and so I'm asking that you would allow this place to be suddenly holy ground and as we come through the line for communion God show us what to do if we need to leave God will take off maybe we're good If we need to recommit ourselves to you, great, we'll do that. If we need to sit in our seat and just allow the band to sing peace over us, we'll receive. If there's somebody, God, that I need to pray for and I need to invite Jesus and expect a miracle, then I'm going to do that. But today, God, is a different day. Something's going to happen in this space. I sense it. So come, Holy Spirit of God, and allow this to be for us, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, so that we can be the body of Christ who are people of peace. And we ask this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.